So what's the difference between benign prosthetic hyperplasia and prostate cancer? Watch this video to find out. So welcome to this video on benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH versus prostate cancer. In this video you'll learn what, uh, what's essentially the definition, what are their risk factors, pathogenesis or pathophysiology and the clinical manifestations of these two prostate conditions. So let's start off with the definition. So the definition of BPH is essentially the H being hyperplasia. Sometimes it's referred to hypertrophy, which means bigger cells, but I think in most cases hyperplasia is more accurate. So hyper means increase, plasia means growth. So essentially what it means is there's an increase in cellular, cellular component of the prostate. Now, looking down at this image down here, we've got two group components of the cells within the prostate. We've got the epithelial component, which is the cells that secrete the fluid and the supporting cells, as well as the stromal cells, which are cells like smooth muscle and connected tissue. So the stromal cells and the epithelial cells, these increase in number. As a result, the prostate gets bigger. And it appears to be most uh, evident in the transitional zone, which is in the middle part of the prostate. So if you look at this image here, what we've done is we've cut through the prostate Okay, in a sagittal plane, we can see the bladder at the top, we can see the urethra going through it. On the outside is the whole prostate, behind it being the rectum. But then within the different zones of the prostate, you can see the most inner zone, the blue part, that's the transitional zone, which appears to be the zone that's most affected with BPH. Now compare that to prostate cancer, this is actually a malignancy or a neoplasm. This means a disordered new growth. So it's not increased growth, it's a disordered growth, okay? It's coming from a glandular part, so it's gonna come from more of these blue cells, which are the tubular or epithelial cells. And it's what we call it adenocarcinoma, which means a cancer that's originating from the glandular comp component. Now, where does it come from? Well, it's about 70 to 80% of all prostate cancers seem to be in the outer part, which is the peripheral zone, actually more likely to be at the back, okay? So that's the two differences in, in definition. In terms of risk factors, for BPH, by far and away the biggest risk is age. So as we get older as males, the risk of developing BPH increases. So when you're about 30 years old, you've got basically a 10% risk of having BPH. But as we get older, so when we move to 60, you're about a 70% chance. And by the time you're in the 80s, you've basically got 90% chance of having BPH. So age is very strong. As well as sex, so really only affecting the males. Even though there is a female prostate, which is the paraurethral glands, but don't think it has the same effect. Family history also suggests that uh, twin, so identical twins, if one has it, the other one has about a 300% chance of developing it as well. Uh, also, if a family member, particularly a primary family member like a brother or a father, has it before the age of 60, the chances of that relative developing it is sixfold, so very high. Now coming across to the risk factors of prostate cancer, it's going to have a similar pattern as we have see, seen here. So age by and far and away is the strongest risk factor for prostate cancer. So as we get older, the chances of it is much higher. Even to the point where they've done autopsies on aged elderly and they've found that about 80% of 80 year olds would have some degree of malignancy, okay? However, the one thing that's possibly good at looking at prostate cancer is that it's a very slow growing cancer. So even though we've all got a very high chance of developing it, the chance of it causing um, significant issues later is lower because it's a slower growing cancer. So it is generally considered around the world the highest cancer that affects males. Now, if it was to come up at an early age, it then by chance is gonna be more aggressive. So age is again the strongest risk factor. Uh, sex, obviously again, all, uh, only in males. 
Family history is a very important one. So if again, a first degree relative like a father or brother has uh, prostate cancer, then the other relative therefore has about 2.5 fold increase, which is 250, 250% increase. Now, if two have it, so two first degree relatives have it, then it goes up to five fold, 500%. Looking at ethnicity, ethnicity, by far and away, it seems that the highest risk group is within America anyway, the African American population. So that's very high, comparable to the other um, populations in that country. Now, also, it seems to be much more dominant in the West. So Northwest in Europe, uh, America, United States, and even higher in Australia and New Zealand. It seems to be fairly low in Asia, Africa, and some of Central South America. But the, the, one of the links is thought to be diet. And so as we consume a more Western diet, which is lower in fiber, higher in fat, it seems that the risk increases. So that is possibly one of the reasons why it's higher in the Western countries is because of diet. Even they've found that, say, populations like Jap Japanese, which is very low in Japan, but when they go to a country like America, after a number of decades, they start to um, develop or the risk of prostate cancer increases. And then also just the, cha the, just the way that the diet is, is changing in, in Asia, it appears that prostate cancer is starting to increase in incidence. And then finally, we've got STIs. So um, sexual transmitted infections like gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia will increase the chances of prostate cancer occurring. Now going to the pathogenesis. So this is essentially, how does it come about? So with BPH to start with, there seems to be an increased ratio between epithelial cells and the stromal cells. Both will increase in number and um, hence is the hyperplasia, but the way that they will cause effects is slightly different. Now the epithelium, so this group of cells seems to be most exaggerated in the transitional zone, so here. And as you can see with the transitional zone, that's right near where the urethra goes past. So as that number increases, what it will start to do is kind of start to constrict the urethra. And this is part of the clinical manifestations we see, which is the obstructive symptoms, which is the constriction. But with the stroma, because we have smooth muscles, so these are the contractile parts of the um, prostate, it, it seems that there are a dynamic change in BPH. So the way that the, the smooth muscles, as they're increasing in number, they start to have changes in the way that they dynamically work, which can affect the constriction and the contraction ca capacity of the prostate, also probably leading to the obstructing symptoms. Another interesting aspect of BPH is the capsule around the ligament. So this would be, let me draw it. This is this kind of outer connective tissue component around the prostate, okay, which you can see here. So that kind of holds it together. It gives it some structure. Now, the only other animal that seems to get BPH is the dog. So the male's dogs seem to get BPH, but they don't have that capsule. So that, therefore, as the prostate cells get bigger, the capsule's not there to hold it in, so it actually expands, and dogs don't seem to develop the obstructive symptoms, the urinary symptoms that humans do. So it appears that the capsule itself has an effect on BPH, at least when we have the, the lower urinary symptoms. The other big one that you need to be aware of is the effect of androgens. So this is the effect of testosterone with the growth in BPH. So Sorry, testosterone will come up. So testosterone comes up into the prostate from the testes. So testosterone comes up. Okay, and what it does is it has a trophic effect. So what it will do, testosterone will come, I'll just put T and T. It will have an effect on the way that the cells grow and um, are nourished, so their viability over time. So both of these are very dependent on testosterone. For instance, if you were to have a male that was castrated before puberty, because we have very little to no testosterone now, the, the, the male later in life doesn't develop BBH. So the androgens or the testosterone have a strong effect. But as we get older, the testosterone levels from the testes decrease. So what actually happens is within the stromal cells, there is an enzyme in there that we call 
5-alpha reductase, which actually changes the testosterone into DHT or dihydrotestosterone, which is 10 times stronger than testosterone. So it actually has a more powerful effect of secreting it to the epithelial cells and the other stromal cells for a continued growth. And it, it's thought that it's this process, the greater efficiency of that enzyme, that increases the chances of BPH occurring. And that's part of the reason why we, in treatment we can sometimes block that hormone or block testosterone and it seems to have a uh, shrinking effect which can diminish those symptoms. Another, well, on that point, besides the DDH and the testosterone, it, it also seems to create, because these are lipid-soluble hormones, they go into the nucleus, it seems that both of these groups of cell starts to produce more growth factors like insulin growth factor and also fibroblast growth factor, which actually seems to also cause these cells to increase their growth. So it's also the growth factors that which have an effect, but that's probably all linked in with the testosterone and the DHT. Another two final points in terms of pathogenesis is we have this kind of ball valve uh, effect. So out here, uh, so in terms of the anatomical lobes, we have uh, anterior lobe or a median lobe, we have two, two lateral lobes and two posterior lobes. And it seems that the, the, there's a ball valve effect as, so this is kind of one valve here and one valve here. And so as the prostate starts to enlarge with BPH, and we have these two big nodules starting to kind of grow on each side of the urethra. As you kind of strain, it kind of compresses the urethra. So that's another uh, effect in terms of the obstructive symptoms of BPH uh, in this condition. And then finally, the detrusor itself. So the detrusor is the muscle within the bladder. And this is regulated with its contraction with neural input. And it appears as a as a male develops BPH and you start to develop obstructive symptoms of urinary flow, it seems that the feedback to the bladder is trying to contract harder and push harder and it seems that the bladder starts to have a dysfunction with its ability to coordinate flow and push out. And so that is also an effect in BPH on how a person's um, obstructive changes or voiding changes is going to happen because they've, they've found that even when it treated for BPH, so when they put a device up the urethra and actually pull out a whole section of the, um, of the prostate gland, which they sometimes call TERP, transurethral resection of prostate, they've found that even when you pull, a bit, pull away the area that's causing the obstruction, because now you have a detrusor effect or dysfunction that the bladder starts that you still have these uh, voiding issues and the bladder isn't regulated well to allow good flow of urine. So there is a, quite a lot of things happening in the pathogenesis in BPH to cause the symptoms. Compare that across to prostate cancer, well it seems that completely it's glandular in origin. So what happens is cells like this develop genetic mutations which then cause them to dysregulate their growth so they'll start just copying and then they'll all these cells will start to grow okay so instead of just increasing the number with bph what we start to see is now this very disordered growth and this is the start of a tumor okay so the, the glandular is generally going to be in those tubular cells in the epithelial area, less likely to be these basal cells and much less likely this green cell, which is what we call a neuroendocrinal cell, which helps to regulate the secretion patterns, which is probably going to come from the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So the, this glandular effect in this growth pattern is the main source of pathogenesis with prostate cancer. You just have this disordered growth starting to grow and grow and grow, which is predominantly in glandular origin and that's how it is diagnosed, which we'll talk about in a second. Androgen, so all that testosterone that we spoke about is also very important in this space. And similarly, what we saw in BPH, if a person was to be 
have chemical castration or castration before puberty, they would not develop prostate cancer. So, so androgens seem to have an effect to kind of lay down the platform for then prostate cancer to then manifest. And even in treatment, when they use androgen blocking therapy, there seems to be effect on reducing the size of the cancer. Now, in terms of how it spread, well, firstly, a thing to be aware of, as we said earlier, the majority of the cancers happen in the peripheral zone and predominantly more so at the back, so in these posterior lobes. And so as it starts to develop out here, okay, it's going to start pushing outwards. So this is a, starting to form nodules, okay? So it's going to go out more, the, more than in. So to actually go into this area here and start to cause obstruction to the urethra is going to be a much later stage than it would be um, pushing outwards. But an important point to be aware of, and this is going to be the capsule, which is sometimes the method of spread. But an important thing to be aware of is the way that the um, connected tissue or the lining of the um, peritoneum comes down from the bladder into the rectum, which usually stops here, we actually have this continuation of fascia that kind of goes behind the rectum, like so, which you can see on this diagram because this is looking at the back, this is looking at the back, so this is the fascia here. So if a cancer was to develop at the back, it's less likely to be able to go through into the rectum because of that fascia. So it actually more likely goes up into the capsule. Now sitting up here, up here is the seminal vesicle which puts some fluid into the urethra, like seminal fluid for semen. And so the spread is very common into the seminal vesicle, sometimes in the neck of the bladder. And then at a later stage, we have these kind of neurovascular bundles that are innervating the prostate. So this is coming in terms of fascia coming in like so. And they've got blood vessels and lymphatics and nerves. And it seems that the cancer will, if moving into a later stage, will go into those bundles and can be transported into say the blood, the, the venous blood, which can then be taken back. And it seems to have a likelihood to go into the vertebral venous flow and that's a very common place of metastasis or spread is in the bone of the vertebra or the pelvis. And so the most common location once it leaves the prostate area is bone. Okay, and that's usually by that spread. Sometimes it will go in with the nerves so it can actually travel back through the perivascular uh, or sorry, the perineural spread, which can sometimes go back into, say, the sciatic nerve or the spinal cord. So it's another way of spread. But by far, if it's contained within the prostate, okay, it's either going to be moving bigger and bigger towards the urethra and then you'll start to get the obstructive symptoms. Or if it's kind of still within the vicinity, it's likely to be in the capsule and the seminal vesicles and maybe the neck of the bladder. So that's the, the methods of pathogenesis to move in from an early to a later stage. In terms of, so finally we'll finish on the clinical manifestations. In terms of the clinical manifestations for BPH, by far the most common are obstructive symptoms. Now the reason for that is because it actually originates in the transitional zone. So it's really going to quickly compress the, the urethra. So you have problems with getting urine out past it. So the bladder stays full, therefore the frequency increases, therefore the person feels like they need to go to the toilet more, particularly at night, so you get nocturia. Then you start to get a problem with the regulation of the bladder contraction, so you start to get voiding issues, so you develop things like hesitancy and also um, dribbling and so forth. And then because you're not emptying your bladder fully, a lot of urine is retained in the bladder and therefore you increase the likelihood of UTIs or infections. Comparing that across to prostate cancer, well by far and away the, the biggest or the most common symptom with prostate cancer is actually none. So the majority of people who are diagnosed with prostate cancer 
is they're actually asymptomatic at that point. And the reason for that is because it develops in the peripheral zone. And so it's not going to, it has to get much big, much bigger to start to go across and compress the urethra to cause these symptoms that we saw with BPH. So it has to be a, a much more advanced cancer or bigger mass to, to cause those symptoms. And usually as it gets later, the prognosis is poorer. Now, how can it be found during asymptomatic? Well, it's usually done with screening, such as PSA levels or um, a rectal examination. So when the doctor puts the finger up the rectum to test, because it's usually located in the peripheral zone, you're gonna feel that um, nodule pushing back against the rectum. And so it will generally feel um, with a degree of asymmetry and nodular, unlike the BPH, how that would probably feel more uniform and rubbery. Okay, so and then in terms of PC, PSA, this is prosthetic um, specific antigen, and that is actually a, a secretion from the epithelial cells into the semen. But that can also go into the blood, and this gives you an gives this can give an indication to the PSA levels to the amount of growth of um, prostate tissue. But it's not necessarily that sensitive because, or specific should I say, because BPH will also increase the likelihood or the increase the secretion of PSA. So PSA is not always 100% accurate. So you can essentially have normal PSA levels and you could still have prostate cancer. Okay, and it doesn't always mean that high PSA means prostate cancer. Other things can cause it like BPH or infections to the prostate and things like that. So sometimes through screening of the rectal examination and the serum PSA, they can be shown as an abnormality. Therefore, in most cases with prostate cancer, that at that point in time, the person would actually be asymptomatic. Then once we move to the obstructive, as I said, it's a much later stage. And then once we get to the metastatic stages of spreading to bone or even urine, blood and urine, that's a much later stage and that the, the stage then is much poor in prognosis. Finally, in terms of diagnosis, by far and away, this one is done usually through the rectal examination and PSA. So that's usually how that is found opposed to being through symptoms, whereas BPH is usually through clinical presentation. But the definitive diagnosis has to be done with a, um, a biopsy. And finally, the way that that is structured is through a Gleason score, which is a score of one to 10. One being, and this is a repeat of one to five. So one to five, one being basically normal, appearing cells, five being very disordered looking cells, and then you repeat it in another, another area of the prostate. So essentially, they'll go in with a needle, pull out a bit of tissue, look under the microscope. If the tissues look normal, like out here, that would get a score of one, but as they become much more disordered, that will get a stage, uh, a score of five. And so the most common uh, appearance they would score one to five, and then they would look elsewhere in that uh, biopsy for the second most common appearance, and they'll do the same thing again, and that would also get a score to one to five. And then therefore, a scoring from two to about six is considered a low grade, but as you move up to towards 10, that is a high grade, a more aggressive form of prostate cancer. Then finally in treatment, the treatment for benign, Prostatic hyperplasia is usually a couple of things. You can block the nerve effect to the smooth muscle cells. So the smooth muscle responds to an, uh, an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. So this constricts or contracts the muscle. So you can block that, which allows the urethra and the bladder to kind of relax a bit more, which allows urine to flow. Or you could also block that 5-alpha reductase enzyme, which seems to d drop off the testosterone effect. In terms of prostate cancer, the way that it's treated is in a combination of things. If it's, if it's contained within the prostate, they kind of have more of a, a, a wait and watch approach. But if it starts to seem to go out and be more aggressive, they seem to want to be a bit more 
aggressive with their approach. And this could be removing the whole prostate, a radiation, right through radiation, should I say. Sometimes they put radioactive seeds into the prostate going up and then they put it into it, um, which is called brachytherapy. And then sometimes they'll also use hormonal therapy, which we saw down there. So there was a lot there, but hopefully now you can see how these two things differ, both in their definition, their risk factors, how they develop in pathogenesis, their common clinical manifestations, and then very briefly, the diagnostics and treatments.